Right. Well, Albert, do you want to um to start by sharing your story ultimately? What got you into the industry and and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, cool. Um, so I um initially uh, so I grew up in South Africa. I got my medical degree there. Um, lived in Cape Town for about ten years, and I worked as a general practitioner for about five years, but. <laughs> In, in my entire like time as a medical doctor, I was really frustrated with the system because I felt that a lot of people that walk in through the door and present with, it, with whatever they present with, often the problem is related to lifestyle changes. It's related to behavior. Even, even conditions like colds and flu has a lifestyle element to it. Um, and, the, and the conditions we saw that created most morbidity and mortality and like just most problems for people tend to be related to how do they actually set themselves up before they step into the consulting room. So I was looking for something that'll be a bit more holistic, that's a bit more empowering. And eventually I came across uh, coaching as a modality. And and so, so the big change for me was um, as a doctor, you're often seen as a savior or someone who helps fix a problem or to um, support someone in, in need. And from a coaching perspective, you actually partner with the person in front of you and you're in a sense a bit more equal. Um, and that really appealed to me because I realized if someone feels they have power over their lives or over their situation or disease or condition, then it frees them up to actually make the changes they need to make. So it just it, it really spoke to me in terms of how I like to work and how I like to support people to rather have power in themselves and actually in, in the end, hopefully not even end up in a consulting room. So um, after I discovered coaching, I did my training there and then I started practicing as a life and health coach and moved to London and yeah, that's what I'm doing full time now. Brilliant. And how long have you been doing the coaching for now? The coaching is about six years now. Yeah, okay. Since, and I've been in London for uh, two and a half years. So yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, it is a paradigm yeah. shift, isn't it? Really the idea of going from a... Mm. A very passive medical model to one where, as you say, the the client is a partner in the journey and and really is empowered within the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's obviously one of the big um, shifts in paradigm, also in the functional medicine space. Right. Um, and and I think where what really resonated with me was uh, from the coaching perspective, where functional medicine tends to focus more on this on the what the what we need to change. Um, coaching really focuses on the how. How do we make the changes? Why do we make the changes? How do we make it easier for ourselves to implement these these necessary lifestyle changes? And and in, in the day and age we are in, it can be quite tricky because life isn't necessarily set up to support us um, to make the best change. I mean, if I look at most of the clients I see in London, their working hours make it almost impossible for them to have a healthy balance. So. Um, helping them find little props to to make that shift is quite important. Mm. Yeah, and it's a, it's a really good point around the the functional medicine model because mm. definitely what I see with clients is that the biggest obstacle, the biggest barrier, the challenge we have is is the behavioural change. Um, yeah. I think you've hit the nail on the head around time being a factor, and I think just life being a lot more complex and complicated yeah. and lived at a faster pace than it was even a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm curious. Um, I know when you, when you contacted me, you said we wanted to headline a few specific topics that you might see or that that interest you. I'm wondering, you know, what do you feel people walk in with? One of the blocks that that tend to stand in the way. I mean, we talk about behavior changes that kind of a headline, but mm. are there specific things that you feel is very common that people kind of struggle with? Very good question. Um... The first thing that comes to mind is is more from, I, I guess, a broad perspective, which is just, mm. in some ways, paralysis by analysis. Mm. Um, mm. So it, there's a lot of confusion, I think. Um, but some of that very much does come from the physiological aspect of things. So, you know, yeah. they've done their reading about the condition or their symptoms. They've read very contradictory bits of information. And as a result, they're confused about what they should be doing from a, a diet supplement lifestyle mm. perspective. So that's probably the most common. But I think it is then, as you say, just around people struggling to find effective, sustainable strategies in the mm. key areas of life, which might be around 
I'll use the term stress management or a mindfulness practice. Mm-hmm. Um, sleep hygiene and sleep habits, I think, is another big one in that sort of yeah. evening routine. So again, another common one with some of my clients who are both busy and parents is I think one of the stories is often that obviously that let's say 10 p.m. till midnight slot is the only time in their day that is for them. Yeah. And they don't want to go to sleep as a result. They want to use that to relax or to be with their partner or, or basically have that time to do something. Yeah, um, yeah. Even though they're also a little bit aware that that might be counterproductive in regards to some of the things they're trying to achieve. Yeah. So there's quite a lot of ambivalence, I think, um, with a lot of the clients who come to see me initially. Mm, mm. Yeah, I, th- I'm, <laughs> I hear you on all fronts. It's one of those things where we want to achieve this goal, but we've got 20 other goals that, that's currently running our lives. Um, so something's got to give, right? Something's, and, and, and it's difficult to make those seemingly small changes when it feels like such a big impact on on your life satisfaction and on what you're currently doing. Because even though, you know, I've, I see clients and when you, it's funny when you mention parents and working parents, especially, and then you add to that, maybe a single parent, um, making changes for them is really overwhelming. Um, because in many ways their lives are structured around kids and around um, work priorities. So my approach would usually be first up is to, to help them in one sense, just shift a bit of the paradigm around, this mountain of, of change that they see ahead of them. Uh, because what I like to help people get clarity on is there's external problems and we tend to be very aware of them and very focused on them. And we tend to frame them in, in you know, quite broad uh, negative terms. Uh, someone might sit and say, um, I'm really struggling with, um, you know, creating time for myself. And it's, it's such a struggle to, to set the schedule up and it's such a struggle, struggle, struggle. So that there would be kind of a keyword that they use to describe their situation. And that for me gives me a window into how they kind of frame it as well, because it might be true that it's a struggle, but some of us, if we have a certain lens on, we filter out the opportunities because we've almost in a sense assumed, oh, it's a struggle and therefore it'll always be a struggle. Instead of saying it might be a struggle, but where are the potential opportunities and helping them reframe and spot those small little gaps uh, where they can make the change and then using those gaps to, in a sense, build some momentum um, towards change. Uh, it's a really interesting and, and fascinating process because if we just have an hour or half an hour, whatever, checking in with someone, uh, it's quite surprising how many blind spots. I mean, I do this every day and I still surprise myself with how many <laughs> blind spots I have. Having a partner is always useful because they can kind of point out, listen, you're still doing that same thing you've always done. Um, but just helping someone see, oh, I've actually reframed the situation in a way that I've almost negated the opportunity. I didn't notice that I had like 10 minutes in between certain things where I could do something else, for instance. Um, so it, I think that's that's quite a, an important shift that I, I find is, is helping people reframe the mental almost lens that they have on the world. And once they start doing that or or getting a bit smarter with that, they internalize that process for themselves. They kind of take a step back in short little moments and just say, oh, how can I view this differently? Is there perhaps an opportunity or a a potential shift that I can make that I just didn't see before? Where previously they would just assume it's a struggle. I'm a single mom. It's almost impossible. I would even use the word impossible when they step in. If you use the word impossible, it's really hard for your brain to generate options because you've, all, in a sense, written it off. It's not possible. So why try? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think, as you say there, perspective and, and the lens we are using to experience the the challenge Mm. the obstacle our life is Mm -hmm. is one of the most powerful things that we can start to shift and and one of the things that popped into my head there was around i know in in our email exchanges you've you've mentioned sort of self-reflection as a, a tool yeah and and i think essentially having some time especially if that time is with someone like yourself who can help you with this change in perspective Mm. in itself starts to shift things because I think sometimes it's just this fundamental lack of time to think and reflect that yeah. is the biggest problem in our lives. Mm. Um, we're just on autopilot all the time and kind of 
expecting a different result sometimes without actually changing our strategy. Yeah, and I, I, I have a lot of empathy for that as well. And um, especially if we you know, choose a specific market and, and I like the idea of a single mom. Um, as an as an as a good example, because a lot of of their lives is in a sense out of their control, and because of that, they feel out of control constantly. Um, and so, what I what I like to to help people see is that even though a lot of life is out of your control, um, there's stuff that are in your control that you're probably unaware of, and we can actually start working there. You don't have to be able to scale the mountain on day one. We can just start looking at what is happening at the moment, and the minute you see your 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 environment a little bit clearer then it's amazing how much leverage you actually have like on the on the topic of time it's one of my favorite things when people come to me and they and they frame their problem as i'm you know i struggle with time management and i would always i wouldn't necessarily say that up front but i would always in the back of my mind think none of us have have a problem with time management um as our primary issue time management just becomes the thing that's so easy to point to, to say, I don't have time for, where often it's actually an issue of priority or an issue of energy or an issue of, um, you know, creating a, a system that supports you. Um, so, for instance, you mentioned earlier about meditation and people wanting to get into meditation. And one of the first things would be, that I don't have 20 minutes for meditation. And I would argue and say, well, you don't need 20 minutes for meditation. In fact, you don't need to be able to meditate in the you know classic sense of I have to be able to clear my mind. It's like that's not the point. The point is when you have a one minute breathing moment, you can take that. And as you do that a little bit more often, your brain starts shifting, your physiology starts shifting and your perspective of, oh, I have control over time starts shifting as well. Instead of assuming, well, there is no time. It's saying, well, where are the little one minute, two minute gaps slipping away and using those to start reflecting and to start doing a, a few things that, that can actually make the bigger change? Yeah, I think that's a it's a common um, bit of advice, I guess, especially around meditation, this expectation mm. that we need a 10, 15, 20, 30 minute practice. Yeah. Um, and I know this is what everyone says, but I do think it's a really... <laughs> Uh, amusing and relevant point which is no one has the same expectation with exercise yeah um, you know you, I think uh, I think it was Dr Chatterjee on his podcast you kind of talked about you don't sign up for a marathon and do it the next day um, yeah you start with something that's realistic to you with the time that you do have etc um, mm. but I I definitely can resonate with what you say there around how over time perspective shifts because it's mm. definitely something I've experienced when I have been consistent with some form of meditation mindfulness practice it's really interesting how you do just start to see things in a different light sometimes or you start to notice things in your day that you hadn't previously mm. Um, mm. and it mm. can be such a powerful tool I think definitely and and on the one level just having that perspective shift feels good on another level your physiology actually changes there's so much great research on the impact of these kind of practices um on that tool of self-reflection because i mean for me the meditation and the reflection are probably like foundational in the coaching process um i i i like starting with where someone's at i well that's generally how i how i work i feel it, it makes most sense rather than you know seeing where we need to be we first look at what's around you and, and how do we use that um and it's it's interesting when people start just taking a minute or two minutes to reflect on what's happening in my life what's actually happening versus you know what i'm imagining is happening like how much time did i actually take to have lunch or how much time do i have between me waking up and the kids waking up those little you know gaps when people start looking at that and then saying, well, what do I do with that time differently? It doesn't have to be a massive thing. It's like, what do I want to do differently today? Even if it's like taking a five minute gratitude journal or it's a two minute breathing session, the minute they start acting into those little spaces that they're aware of, you as in terms of your awareness of power, has there's a massive shift where you started off feeling out of control, suddenly you've started taking control. And by taking control, you feel more in control. And then that, that creates a leverage for the next step of, you know, what.
that's overwhelming. That's often why I, you know, why coaching helps because coaching helps you see your life and not get overwhelmed with it because I help you reframe it as well. Because people sometimes struggle to see, oh, this is actually what's really going on for me. I'm allowing a lot of things to spin out of control when I can actually, you know, start taking it back into, reining it back in and then and taking it on. Um, so it's really help, helping people break down those mountains, those marathons, um, those 20 ki kilograms they need to lose into what am I doing today and what can I celebrate in terms of that success? And then 20 uh, days later, you'll see how much change has happened instead of looking at you know the mountain and just giving up before you even started. Mm, that's really good insight. I think that's I think it helps people have that expectation of what the journey is going to look like. And what you talk about um, the mountain, it, it reminds me of a point in a book I've read. I can't remember the book, unfortunately. Yeah. But they talk about this idea that if you spend too much time thinking about where you want to be, one of the mm. problems with that is you're almost placing your attention on the void, the gap between where you currently are and where mm. you want to be. And, and sometimes I guess that can act in a negative way because you're actually just focusing on this gap where there is between where you are and where you want to be. Mm. Whereas what mm. you're saying around focusing on these five, 10, 15 minute little periods in our day and how we can take control and take power, I think is a really powerful tool. Mm, yeah, definitely. Another, um, and I know we mentioned it um, in our email before as well. Uh, I think there's there's an assumption when we, when our lives are overwhelmed with stress and with busyness or whatever it is, we tend to have such a negative perspective simply because we're in a stressed state. So our mind is in a stressed state, our body is in a stressed state, that we filter out the good and we see the negative almost like um, amplified. So one of the things that people would assume, they walk into the door and they say, one, I'm, I don't have any time and I'm really struggling with that. And I know I need to have more willpower to overcome this. And I know I need to, you know, give up this and, and sacrifice that in order to achieve what I want to achieve. They're so aware of all the negative things that need to happen. And so one way to help them shift that is just to one, take a step back and then say, well, how do we reframe this? One, you might not need as much willpower. You actually have this and this and this at your disposal, certain resources. We look at where are your resources? We look at where is your power? Where have you already made changes? If you're a very ambitious career person, that means that you've applied yourself in a specific direction. That means you have power. How do we leverage that power in a different direction instead of thinking you have to add something else to your list? Um, so helping people kind of reframe their situation and and see where the opportunity is rather than the gaps gives them a sense of, of, of resources as well. So they're able to tap into the resources that's available to them. The willpower challenge uh, is, is, is also quite an interesting one. If you go online and you search willpower and the research they've done, um, the, there's a lot of research and then about three years um, earlier they debunked so much of the research so I tell people you know what it's not that important to focus on willpower what might be more useful is to make life easier for yourself actually instead of thinking I need more willpower take it out of the equation uh, a classic example and it's one of the simplest things that I know all of us tell our clients is instead of having treats in your house that are tempting just don't have them there because the inconvenience of having to buy sweets that might be negative to your health will be too big. So then you'll just eat what's there, which is healthy. And if you do that often enough, your body gets used to it and you start creating a new habit. Instead of feeling that you need to scale this mountain, just take the mountains out of the way that aren't even supposed to be there or doesn't have to be there. Mm -hmm. One thing that I do is I make sure that my gym bag is packed when I leave because if I come back home, I'm not going to go back to gym because then I have to get dressed again and get the, the whole mission of going, instead of having that mission, they take it out of the equation, make it easier for yourself. That's why we do meal planning, as, as we both know, is, is because when life happens and when you're in that routine in the week, you don't want to add another obstacle of planning a meal now when you're in the middle of it. You want it ready planned. So it's those small – and people, people always find it surprising how easy it is. <laughs> And in a sense, it's, it's a bit deflating as well because you were ready to scale this mountain and all I want you to do is walk three steps. Um, but the, the, 
the result is so satisfying because three months later, you've actually done a lot more than you ever thought possible. Mm. It might take three months, but the point is it's been three months of consistent, small, easy changes rather than one week of, of upholding your, your entire existence. Right. And I, I quite like the term, which I think uh, correlates with what you're saying there, which is success is built on success. Yeah. So I always yeah. say to clients, you know, I would prefer us to make a few really small changes that you can look back on in a week or two and go, brilliant, I've achieved everything I, mm. I set myself as a ripple effect into continuing the journey. Yeah, it's so important. A lot of people um, find it a bit disillusioning when they come to you for the first session and we only have one or two things. And this is one thing that I often do in my first session. So a client, and often when they sign up, they have, they're energized and they're motivated and they want to do something and they feel they're ready now. So they would set like 10 impossible goals for themselves. And I would double check with them and I would say, well, we might not achieve these goals, but they fired up. So they feel like, yeah, they will. They're ready now. They've finally made the commitment. And what I'd say is let's, let's just be ready for something. So either at next week's session or three weeks in or four weeks in, we might come to a point where any or all or some of the goals you've set, you haven't achieved. You've in a sense failed. What I'd like you to be ready for when that happens is that we see that as a learning opportunity rather than a failure. Because I'm expecting you to fail, not because I think you're bad at what you do, but because we're human and we don't always know exactly what our capacity is and because life happens. Sometimes you'll set ambitious goals and life will throw you a curveball and then you have to adjust. And it's a very useful way for people to start recalibrating around success because if you've failed and you've set, if you set an impossible goal and you fail it, you get so demotivated, you don't even want to get started again. Mm -hmm. Where if we see the failure as a learning opportunity to adapt, then we're constantly just adjusting for what life gives us. And that's, that's exactly what you're saying. That's such, such an important core principle is we need to build on successes. We can't expect the impossible of ourselves and then fail and then be disappointed it's your expectation that was mismatched it's not your performance it's not the fact that you failed that's the issue it's just that you might have set a goal that wasn't really matching your reality so it, it gives people a bit more room to breathe on one month you you do better in your habits than on another month because on one month it'll just be easier because life's different life's constantly in flux and developing that capacity to adapt to your environment is probably one of the most important skills that, that we need to learn because you can have the most amazing successes for like six months and suddenly um, your job changes or there's a project that comes up or you have to travel or your grandmother dies. And then we're ready to have to handle those changes and to, to give ourselves a bit more generosity when we fail in those seasons because then we can get back up. Mm. Yeah, I think that's so true. And there's never been a time where resilience is more needed. Um, mm. And I love the whole topic because I think it's important from a pure functional medicine perspective when we're thinking about the physiology of stuff. Uh, yeah. We need that ability to adapt physically to our environment. But I'm equally mindful that, especially for today's conversation, that the ability to adapt in regards to our cognition, our thinking and our emotional mm. ability to regulate ourselves is is arguably more important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the way in which you interpret the world that creates your reality. It's something that, you know, that's, prim that's probably the primary tenet of my work is helping people see that reality is one thing and your view of reality is another thing. So, for example, if if I work with a client who's, who tends to and who labels themselves as someone who's quite anxious or they say, like, I'm always more anxious than my brother or whatever. Um, what I'd remind them of is that that's OK and that's great to have that awareness. Now, with that awareness, it means that if we compare it to a fire alarm, that if 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 your anxiety is a form of a fire alarm compared to your brother who's not that anxious, you'll probably go off when there's just a cigarette being lit where your brother's fire alarm will only go off if there's an actual fire, right? So if that's kind of your your level of anxiety, your level of, of, of threat awareness. Now that you know that, 
it means that to some degree, even just being aware of that, you can turn down the volume of your fire alarm. You can notice your anxiety and obviously with mindfulness practice and those things, you can start moderating your experience of the world. And the minute you moderate your experience, in a sense, you're changing your reality over time. Once you realize that you, you're someone who interprets the world in a certain way and you have a little bit of control over your interpretation, it means you can adjust that interpretation to, to, to closer match to reality, to say, is this anxiety appropriate in this situation? Is it really warning me or is it me in, a, in some ways hyper reacting to, to a potential threat? And once you know that, you can turn that volume down and then you feel better and then your, you know, your stress response is better and that, that cascade of positive effects and start setting in motion. It's quite a powerful shift. You're, you're right. When you start noticing your your mind's um, interpretation interpretation of reality and your capacity to to create changes there. Mm. Yeah, and and not just I guess your mind's interpretation of reality, but just the inner dialogue that's going on. Mm. Because I think you know I'm probably have been one of the worst at it in regards to just not being aware of it. And then when I started practicing some mindfulness, being aware of how crazy my head could be at times mm. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. in regards to whether that's, you know, the inner critic that some authors talk about um, mm. or whether that's, you know, the degree of self-compassion that I was having for myself, the pressure I was putting on myself. Mm. Um, and I think it's interesting that, what we learn about our internal world when we just have that little bit of space. Mm. I'm curious when you, you know, you've mentioned now with mindfulness practice, when you notice those inner voices, <laughs> we always laugh at our inner voices. Um, are there certain things that you then started doing to adjust that as well? Like what, once you know, what do you do with it? Cause a lot of people, they, they try the meditation they say, I can't, you know, quiet the voices in my head. And if anything, they get more anxious when they're trying to do the meditation. And then they stop because it just, it's, it's overwhelming. I'm mm -hmm. curious, you know, what, how, how did you respond to that? Yeah, you when? know, I had, I, I have a client who I've started working with and she has a lot of um, anxiety, partly related to her physical condition as well as mm. other aspects. But we kind of we've had some quite long conversations about, um, I guess, both of our journeys, our health journeys, because um, I try mm. and I try and give clients sometimes a bit of perspective through through my experience. Um, and one of the things that I think I've unknowingly done in the past is I just haven't attached. And I haven't identified with symptom X or problem Y. Um, so in some ways, I guess there may have been a form of mindfulness there already. But I've never, I've never tried to change it. So it's mm. always been an awareness and it's kind of just stopped there unintentionally. So a couple of years ago, I, was, um, I went through a period, a very short period, probably about three months, where every now and again I was, I was having some anxiety. Um, and it was an anxiety that was very different to an anxiety about, let's just say public speaking. It, it very much started in the stomach and would sort of work up to my chest. It was quite powerful. And, it, and there was one morning I remember whereby I was on the train actually up to my London clinic and I almost had to get off the train. It was quite a powerful oh, wow. anxiety panic type attack, I imagine. Mm. Um, and in that instance, I just kind of breathed my way through it. And without kind of going down a tangent, it actually ended up that there, I think there was a gastrointestinal infection because I did a stool okay. test. I had some gut symptoms at the time. There was a bacterial infection there and treating that. I haven't had any of that kind of anxiety since. Mm. And with what we know about the gut brain access, it kind of makes sense to me that that was one of the underlying issues going on because there was nothing going on in life that should have led to anxiety ultimately. Mm. But the conversation I had with my client and what she actually picked up on was my lack of attachment to things. So, you know, mm. when I was 20, I would wake up in the morning and I would hobble to the bathroom. My ankles, knees, lower back were just inflamed, achy. And generally, I, I must have felt like I was extremely old compared to being 20 yeah. years old. But I never identified with it. Um for right or wrong, I guess, from that perspective back then. Um, mm. So going back to your question, it was really, it's just awareness. 
Mm. Um, and I find that that awareness is an well, or certainly for me was kind of enough to to help process it. It was almost mm. like I just needed to know it was occurring so I could then in some ways acknowledge it but mm. I didn't consciously then try and be kinder to myself. I think there was just a natural consequence of being aware of it that led mm. to improvement in in well-being. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. That, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because, and and I'm asking because it's so different for different people as well. Um, but that capacity of unattachment, whether or not you then create other shifts or, or, or reframe certain inner dialogues, which is sometimes what clients do with journaling um, is by trying to reframe some of the inner voices, although it'll always in some degree be there. But the first step is definitely that sense of you are not what the voice in your head says you are, or you are not the, the feeling that you have. Mm. That capacity to not be consumed by whatever the experience is. Without that, nothing else can follow. Without that, the sense of having any power or having anything else other than this experience um, is really difficult, which is why it's so important for people to start having that sense of this experience. One, I am not this experience. I'm, you know, in a sense, detached from it. And two, this experience is constantly changing. Um, my experience of reality, irrespective of what is happening in reality, is constantly changing. And that's what I found one of the things that are most powerful for me in the mindfulness practice um, or any meditation for that matter is that when you keep checking in with what's going on for you, what's going on for you in this moment and the moment after this is completely different. And the minute you notice those nuances, in some ways it, it also for me kind of decreases certain problems that in my mind I've almost set up as permanent structures. Um, this sense of, of stress, you know, people talk about I'm always stressed. Just the frame always stressed tells me there's a certain way they view reality where if they check with their bodies, their bodies is constantly in flux. Their minds, their emotions are constantly in flux. And if you notice the times when you're in some ways a little bit, feel a little bit more calm, a little bit more spacious, and, you, and you're more aware of those times, you'll, that already decreases your perception of stress. Suddenly you realize I'm not always stressed. I'm just not aware of the times when I'm actually not that stressed or 80% stressed or 60% stressed. So that slight shift of awareness suddenly gives you a bit more movement internally and externally in terms of, of, of how you, how you approach reality. Mm. And I think what, what comes to mind with all of, all of this is, um, is the idea of living by our values as well. Um, mm. And I think there's a really great paper that you'll probably enjoy. It's called the, it's called the metacognitive model of insomnia. Oh yeah, and they basically talk about how it's our it's the it's our thinking about our thinking, which mm. is the biggest problem in in insomnia. So it's not the fact that you're waking before the alarm, but it's everything that goes on as a result of waking before the alarm, so to speak. Okay. <laughs> um, and one of the strategies the authors talk about is living by your values. So a really simple example might be if you are a sociable person and you value your relationships and things, but you've had a really bad night's sleep when possible, don't cancel that social engagement you've got, even if you are going to be tired, i.e. don't let the experience become all encompassing and mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. go to the social engagement, live that value of being a social person and valuing your relationships and maybe just leave early um, if you mm. need to. Um, but also they talk a lot about our beliefs and our understanding of, of sleep and sleep loss and mm. what what do we actually believe about sleep how much we require how we perform on little etc because mm. sometimes they used examples of neurosurgeons and pilots who are performing very uh performing things at an incredibly high skill level sometimes without any hours sleep for 36 hours yeah. So it, I think it's really interesting when you also start to dive into what are your beliefs or what are some of the assumptions that are leading to this concern about only having six hours sleep or whatever yeah. it may be. Mm, mm. Yeah, those beliefs are, <laughs> they're tricky because because there's also recently a study, recently, probably two, three years now, um, where they found that stress isn't as much of a problem um, from a health perspective as your beliefs about stress. 
um, some TED talk or something, but it's easy to find online where they've realized that we've, in a sense, we've labeled stress a certain way and that has an impact on how our minds interpret it and not just how we see it mentally, but also then the physiology that follows because your physiology in many ways follows your interpretation of reality. Um, they, there's another study um, and I'll have to double check the accuracy of this because it sounds almost ridiculous, but they had they interviewed domestic workers in the US about how much exercise they get. And um, most of them would say they get almost no exercise. And then one half of the group, they um, gave them trackers and they helped them notice how much they actually do in a daily basis just by doing their jobs, like how much m they move and whatever. And they actually noticed a change in blood pressure and two or three other markers in the group that became aware of the fact that they're exercising simply because of that shift in perspective that then in some way the mind then aligns with what the body is doing and whatever you know magic physiology happens the result is different and it's literally nothing's changed in terms of their behavior but in chain it changed in terms of their perception of what they are actually doing um, which is why i love my job because i feel like when I can help someone in their perception, in many ways, it's in many instances, it's the foundation of a lot of other things. The behavior sometimes just follows after that, yeah. once you actually have that kind of fundamental mind shift. But the tricky bit is, um, one, clarifying your values. This is a an, an ongoing challenge in some coaching conversations. And uh, what are your beliefs? like, and, and why do you believe it? Because... Uh, it's quite it's quite incisive questions when you're in kind of a survival mode and just trying to get by and someone asks you well what is important to you it's it can be a bit overwhelming to ask that question you know on a Wednesday evening <laughs> but I think it is an important thing for people to start dipping into and and it doesn't have to be an overwhelming exercise that they need to have answers for um, but unless you get a little bit behind some of the motivations of what you do the changes you make um, tend to be temporary and they tend and and the the behaviors that stick tend to be enforced by certain beliefs that you have um, and when you can get to the belief system it's a lot easier than to or it's i think it's a lot more sustainable when you then make a change because you're you're making it on the basis of either shifting your beliefs or getting more aligned with your core beliefs um, and then everything else is you know the, the motivation to maintain that is also stronger uh, one good example was a client that came to me to lose weight and um, they weren't ready to do a meal plan or anything and just wanted to use a Fitbit and walk more. That was the level of commitment they had on a behavioral level, right? Which which tells you, mm, I'm not sure if this will work, but you know, I'll start with what the client's able to engage in. But their incentive was, I don't want my children to grow up with a with a dad without a dad because if I don't lose weight I'll you know have a heart attack there's a big risk because quite a bit obese and that motivation then enabled him to move from just doing his Fitbits to eventually changing his meal plans to eventually losing his his 10k's um, and it was so interesting for me because I realized um, when people walk in and their goals don't align that with a core important motivating value then you know for instance if i want to lose weight for the summer in the winter i pick up the weight again and and also never never mind the weight itself my relationship to food is probably still not necessarily healthy which is you know more important so helping people dip a little bit deeper in terms of the drivers of their behavior i think it's so important but um it can be tricky it can be tricky to just pause and say, well, why? You know, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I not stopping what I know I shouldn't be doing? Those kind of questions. Yeah, and I think, gosh, I, I've had this conversation. I'm not sure if it was on the podcast. If it was, it was probably with Dr. Germa on, on mm -hmm. self-compassion. But recently I've had a conversation, and whoever it was with made the really good point, which is you need a fundamental level of awareness before you can even have these questions and conversations mm. so I don't think they're even sometimes the first thing to start with because there is the argument yeah. that let's start with your values because then that can help us understand you what's important and go from there but even understanding what our values are I don't think is an easy 
exercise. Mm. And I also think they're very much staggered. You can have a value that is contradictory with another one, which is only apply a, a, applicable in a certain context of life. Or yeah, yeah. if you achieve one value, you automatically are kind of achieving another one. So it's almost like a second tier value. Yeah. Um, but I do think, as you say, having some time where you just compassionately and slowly start reflecting and thinking about these things can be really powerful. Mm. And one of the questions that's come, in, come into my mind based on what you were saying then and this is probably an episode in itself, but I, I, I'm, I'm curious on what your experience and thoughts are around, because it's something I've thought about a bit, which is behavioral change and changing our life, our behavior, etc. There seems to be two ends of the spectrum in the self-development world. Mm. Some people who say behavioral change is really hard. And as a result, we need those small baby steps and to, to nurture the client, so to speak, or support the client through that process. Mm. And then there's this kind of other end of the spectrum, which is, you know, you can change your life today. And there are mm. cases that, you know, it's, it's uh, are evidence that it can occur. And I guess, mm. you know, we're all different. It's going to be different in different contexts. But... Are you someone that believes that this can that we can have rapid significant shifts when the time is right or would you say the majority of the time we need to go slow and steady and I appreciate it's going to be kind of individually based as well mm. but do you have any thoughts Yeah I'm I'm going to give you probably a very unsatisfactory <laughs> answer um but maybe instead of just choosing a camp i um, maybe elaborate a bit on on when what type of change might happen yeah. from my experience and i would say definitely you know definitely both are possible and definitely the slow and steady one makes most sense to most of us um especially if change needs to happen in the context of your life mm. um because je um, when someone walks in your doors they want to change one specific element of life, but everything else, in a sense, supports each other. You know, the routines, the habits, the lifestyle. They can make an overall change, and it can be quite rapid. One, if, if there's been a big shift in event already, they, they've moved jobs, they've moved countries, they've started a new life um, with a partner, something like that. In many ways, we can use it as a catalyst to, in a sense, spin off a lot of other changes. But the motivation needs to be quite strong. And, and, and some clients work that way. It's like you say, personality dictates a big part of that. However, um, in my experience of human development, even if you make those massive changes, a big part of your personality construct, if you think physiologically, but I would also um, um, argue from a personality perspective, has become the way it has because of the years of change. Nothing in nature changes overnight. I mean... If you look at a plant, it grows really slowly. Even, a, even you know, an acorn becomes a tree, a massive tree over years and years and years. And even if you cut it down and do something drastic, you can't change the fundamental nature of it. You'll have to bend it over time for it to be a true change, a change that has integrity. You can paint it a different color and it'll be completely different. But for, from my perspective, that's a superficial change. Um, so I think when it comes to human development, you can make a lot of big changes, but in terms of main maintenance and for that to have integrity in terms of your entire life, that takes time to settle in. So you can maybe do a lot, you know, lose a lot of weight, um, you know, start meditating, do yoga, whatever it is, like 20,000 things, but it'll probably take about a year or two for it to have an effect in terms of overall personality change, overall lifestyle change, and obviously also the benefits of, of, of those changes. But yeah, it's entirely possible. I think it, it's just um, when people sign up for the quick fix, I'm always suspicious mm. um, because we live in a culture that sells quick fixes in contexts where they can't happen. And also I would always, always ask, well, where's the sustainability element of this? Yeah. If we do get this change suddenly, how are we going to start shifting gears when we have to maintain? So now you've done X, Y, Z. Have you got the stamina to keep it going <laughs> You know, <laughs> six months later or when something else, a curveball hits you? Are you going to fall back on old 
mind habits, which is, you know, what you've learned your entire life. It's much easier to fall back in those habits. Um, does that make sense? In makes terms huge of sense. Framing it's a, the... No, it's a, a really good answer. Um, and part of that, I guess, goes back to what you mentioned earlier around the, how important our environment is within this behavioral change topic. And actually, I can mm. relate to that because we moved house in November uh, yeah. and we went from a tiny one bed apartment that was far too small for both of us to kind of a, a nice end terrace um, that's kind of a borders a, a big park. Mm. And for two weeks, we also didn't have Internet which was just oh, yeah. like heaven really um <laughs> yeah. but every every morning 7 seven thirty, i was walking around the park you know change in environment lack of something that we're glued to mm -hmm. and it was really easy for me to go and get like my ten thousand steps in by 8 a.m and it mm. was great and it lasted a certain amount of time but i will put my hand on my heart and kind of say well honestly i'm, I'm not doing this daily anymore it's like i've fallen back on my hardcore habits and beliefs maybe as well now that things have got back to normality um, yeah. which then ties in with have you read um atomic habits by james no, clear I haven't. Mm -mm. so he one of his big messages is that habit change is is heavily identity change and mm. unless you're starting to change your identity it's going to be hard to successfully change a habit so the really easy example i give which is I'm not sure if it's one that he, the author gives in his book, but you know, do you identify yourself as an exerciser or someone who does some exercise because you know it's good for you? And as a result, when you go away on the business conference and there's no gym, are you the one doing some lunges and press ups in the bedroom? Or are you someone mm. who will use that as the reason not to exercise for four or five days? Mm. Um, and it's a little bit of an extreme example maybe, but I, I, I like this idea of, you know, our identity being a big compartment of the of these habits, ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really love that you made that con or that well, the author made that connection. Um, because when, you know, when I look at the different modalities we use in behavior change, I, I would have to say I'm least attached to habit based changes for that very reason that it often feels like something that I'm, I'm i'm waiting for the system to break in a, in a sense i almost see like someone coming in and wanting to change habits and being very focused on kind of behavior 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 and i'm waiting for the the structure that maintained life before the habit to enforce itself on the habit and say no well you'll you know come back to default come back to the way that that things were right. um so I, I i am reluctant sometimes to to only think of habit changes they're very useful and they're great models um, to help us create shifts. But you do need to align it, one, with identity in terms of who you are. So what I like to use um, when it comes to self-awareness as well and growing in, in, in the sense of your self-knowledge is the Enneagram. I don't know if you've, you've heard it. Yeah. Or heard it? Yeah. So the Enneagram is um, kind of an ancient system that nowadays people use as a typology so it's it creates a sense of you know why do you do what you do in the world what are your core motivators and fears and in if i want to implement behavior changes or habits or whatever and i have someone's enneagram and they they're a bit more conscious of for instance i'm an exerciser or i'm someone who likes to achieve things or i'm i'm someone who likes um to maintain the peace or whatever it is kind of, kind of core attachments they have then it's much better to align your habits with those core motivators if you want them to last, like you said. If that's one of the reasons why people would say if you want to start running and you join a running club, it's it's a lot easier for you to maintain it because in some ways your your um, social environment will start shifting your identity because you'll be one of the runners. It'll be something you can add to your identity. But in the same instance, if at your core, um, you're not someone who likes to exercise, but you're doing it because you have to. We need to find out what are the core motivators that act that actually give you a sense of who I am in the world. What 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 do I like to be seen as? And see if we can align your behavior with that instead. I'm not that attached for people to change their behavior simply based on what you know pop culture tells them to. Mm. You know, every every few months there's a new fad on yoga or this or that. I'd rather start with where you're at and where can you start making the changes you can make 
Um, if it's basic movement changes like walking 10,000 steps, that's great. That's already 10,000 steps further than someone sitting behind their desk, for instance. Um, so rather start with something that you can, uh, can attach to your values or your identity than you know, what social media tells you is the next healthy fad because um, it won't last. Uh, yeah, and when, um, when you asked me earlier about what are some of the biggest obstacles I see with clients and things, mm. your response to my response, one of the things that then popped into my head was kind of what you've mentioned there, which is I think a lot of clients are they're looking for answers or they're utilizing strategies that other people have done that might have led mm. to success and there's i think there's sometimes a lack of self-knowledge intuitiveness that rather than actually seeking their own answer they're just trying to get answers from anywhere and everywhere else as uh, for whatever reason that may be Mm. Um, but I'm a big believer that if we can, as you say, take the time to self-reflect and have that time available to us, we can start to understand actually, well, what is our relationship to exercise? So a paper that I found yesterday was basically discussing, look, for some people, physical activity is a source of joy. And as a result, they're going to be doing it on a very regular basis. Mm. Where for other people, physical activity might be a way of managing their chronic pain. So they're going to be mm. doing it regularly, but for a completely different system or reason. reason. Mm. Mm. And other people are kind of almost actively trying to avoid physical activity for, for other reasons. Um, yeah. And understanding your relationship, your view on exercise, I think is really important. So bringing that mm. back to a practical aspect, how many clients have I had who go to the gym because they know they should exercise because it's healthy for them? But they mm. haven't really explored, well, what exercise do they enjoy? What alternatives are there compared to just the gym? Which can be, for some people, obviously very monotonous. That It's not necessarily a nice environment in mm. a lot of commercial gyms. And as a result, I think we're kind of, again, often banging our head against the wall. And I'm as guilty of this, obviously, as, as everyone. Yeah. Um, but I think, again, taking that step back and, as you say, just viewing the... Uh, viewing what's going on underneath the surface, underneath the water, as it were, mm. can help us make behavioral change that actually aligns with us and what we value and what we want. Mm, absolutely. I mean, I think you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of the foundation of my work. Um, it's, it's an interesting process and it's one of the moments that I probably enjoy the most is helping people realize that they know already in, in many ways, that's that's my work at its peak is when I facilitate a process where you start with the question and you give yourself the answer, but you didn't know that you had the answer and no one else could give you the answer. So what would sometimes happen in the initial part of the process when I'm setting up the contract is people would, you know, kind of say, this is what they want to achieve or this is what they want to do. And they would ask me and say, well, can, can you not tell me what to do? And I'd sometimes say no. And then they'd be taken aback, kind of like, oh, you know, feel a bit insecure. Like, why, why wouldn't you give me something because you're the expert, et cetera, et cetera. And I would reinforce with them and I'd say, you know what, I'm, I'm happy to offer a few suggestions and, I'm, you know, we can, we can go online. You can Google the question if you wanted to. But my sense is that there's no one else in the world like you with exactly the, you know, combination of life circumstances and personality that you have. So... If we spend some time together and just explore that, you can tell me what you think will actually work. And I'm pretty sure it'll work better than anything you've read online. Because even if you take some of the information from certain sites and experts, the way that integrates into your specific particular reality at this time is so unique that only you will know. But for you to know, you do need to take a step back. You do need to pause and kind of ask yourself, what do I need now? Um, but not just what do I need, global term, but what do I need now? And if you have that time and you actually respond to that need, it's an amazing, um, satisfying process because you'll discover that you actually have the answer, you'll be able to implement it, and you'll actually experience the change. Um, it's too 
too often do I see people trying on something someone else said, and it's almost like just you know putting on clothes that don't fit you, mm. or wearing something that you wouldn't wear because it's not your style. You're just constantly kind of uh, you know uncomfortable in that space, and it doesn't last. Where if you really find the kind of behaviors and changes that align with your values, your beliefs, your personality, then change becomes a natural outflow of that. It's not it's not even effort anymore. It's actually fun. Right. You know, it's actually like, wow, this is satisfying. Yes, because you're meeting core needs of of who you are as a human being. Mm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well said. And I think the idea of that pause resonated with me because I know mm. certainly over the last two, three years, it's it's been when I've been on holiday that I've had by far the deepest, most meaningful mm. uh, realizations about, you know, things that, I need to improve upon or something that's been bugging me that I've had that epiphany moment of, oh, okay, that's how something can change. Yeah, yeah. And it is, it's because you've got that time out, you've got that opportunity, not only, I think, to actually reflect a bit more objectively now you're out your daily routine, but you're out that environment that often mm. is driving some of those habits as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just, um, it's been quite an, an adaptation for me moving from Cape Town to London for good reason. Um, but we've actually decided now and we've scheduled it in for the rest of the year that at least one week in a month, I take a long weekend out of the city. Um, and that's my commitment to myself to have that more extended period where my body can, you know, deregulate where I have space to reflect and reorient what is happening in my life at the moment. And is this still on track? Mm -hmm. Um, everything keeps changing. So if you don't have that regular check in and commitment to yourself, um, things do get ahead of you. You know, even if even if you're in the the business of healthy lifestyle, you know, we also get overwhelmed with choices and with stress and with life. So, um, yeah, that's definitely one habit that I would if someone can afford to create time, if you can leave your kids with a parent and just for one day take that time out, it it can be life changing. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Well, I'm cool. I'm mindful of time, Albert. So is there yeah. anything that um that you would like to reiterate or I guess conclude with? That's a really good question. <laughs> you should be a coach. <laughs> I usually I usually ask this question from clients when they're done with the session. <laughs> this is what, what it feels like. Them, yeah, that's what it feels like. Thanks. Um, no, I suppose, um, you know, if there's, life can be extremely overwhelming alex we both know this um that's why we love what we do that that's also the challenge of what we do um and i suppose if i can give people one um one gem to take home with or to really reflect on it's that you give yourself permission to pause um and allow yourself to listen to yourself um for 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 what you need um listening to what i need what our needs are is probably the starting point of anything else before you think about what you have to do and what society expects of you and what the family and what your health professional expects of you. If you can just pause every now and again and tune into what do I need now? I think that's an, that's an amazing starting point for self care. Um, and it's a surprising journey, um, a surprising and, 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 and adventurous journey, uh, once you start doing that. So yeah, give yourself permission to do that. Anything that stands out, for you from the session anything that kind of oh, pivot points where to start <laughs> <laughs> um one thing i will say because i think it's um it's it probably adds weight to the value of the question is mm. chris germ i had on two weeks ago and i'm i'm pretty sure you haven't listened to this episode so this mm. is the universe telling all of us to ask this question more because i asked him for I think something like a, a tool or a simple strategy we can use mm. um, to help practice self-compassion. And he said the question, what do I need? Oh, wow. Um, so I, th I thought <laughs> it's quite cool that you've also Good brought alignment. up that question. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the universe is definitely speaking to definitely. us right now. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, but yeah, I think to, in all honesty, everything that you've mentioned, in, environment, values, um, mm. identity, um, and essentially just looking a bit deeper, I think, ultimately, um, a term that comes to mind with a lot of what we've spoken about today is sort of self-trust. 
Mm. Mm. Um, and actually trusting ourselves that we have an answer within us if we have the time to find it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, just get started. Take yeah. that five seconds and listen. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cool. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Albert. It's been an yeah. absolute pleasure. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. And I'm sure everyone's going to uh, have found this extremely helpful. I hope so. Yeah. Thanks for having me and 